We look beyond where we are if somebody comes to us and try to empower that person. We may know of somebody, an advocate or a shelter or something to help them. And the mental health side, usually that's a fine line too, because if you're mental health, you're abusive to everyone. But in, in the case of domestic violence, you're just abusive to that love, to that intimate partner. So we have to be careful how we label this and and because mental health, yes, plays a part because some of us are very, you know, some people are very unstable mentally, but we have to make sure that we categorize it and, and treat it as what it is because mental mental illness is different from domestic violence because if you're, a, if you're an abuser, you're just going to be, you know, mean to that intimate partner. If you're, if you have mental health, it's going to affect everyone, your community, your job, everyone. So I think we want to be careful how we label them. Did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and Dr. Crumpton, uh, you can follow up. Sure. So right along with what Wesley is saying, like one of the things I really um, got very clear about um, in a very practical way um, when I was working in the courts is that um, oftentimes there would be a court case and they would, um, so sometimes the attorneys would say, well, this person has mental health concerns. And it was, big, and, and what's interesting about that is that it was very helpful that we were trained to say that may be accurate. However, just like Wesleyan said, there's a difference between mental health concerns um, and someone who has the psychology, the, you know, the psych psychological structure of someone to use abuse and violence towards someone in an intimate relationship. And the reason why that became important is because we had to realize that this is not anger management. <laughs> you know, because we'll say they have an anger problem um, or they'll say, um, or the conversation will be, well, um, they only act like that when they've been drinking or if they're high, right? Um, and, and so at that point, then now we need to think about a substance abuse concern and an intimate violence, um, a concern around intimate violence. They aren't, um, they aren't one in the same, you know, and another piece of this I think is really important is there's a huge stigma around mental health concerns, right? Um, so there are ways in which it's easier um, for us to say, well, it's not even easier. It's almost kind of like we're, it's, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do you want to be labeled um, an abuser? Or do you want to be labeled someone who has a mental health concern, right? I mean, or, um, yeah. And so when those two kind of come together, because there's oftentimes a lot of shame around being victimized, mm -hmm. it's easier and more acceptable in some ways to say this person has a mental health concern that can that word those words can come out of the mouth of someone who is being abused they have mental problems as opposed to i am being abused right um so some of it is um has to do with a lot of the shame and the stigma right around i won't say that they cause um intimate violence but in terms of the promotion of domestic violence in communities of color the kind of like the culture of silence just like what someone was saying you know, that we don't tell, and that's especially acute in our faith communities, right? You really don't tell right. in your communities of faith. Like, you don't tell about much of anything. You know, if there's some sort of violence, if there's abuse, if there's mental health concerns, if there's um, even just kind of just normal everyday structure struggles in the family, you know, there's a culture of silence around um, what goes on in a family structure. Right. Um, and part of it is that um, there's a culture of silence around violence within the African-American community related to partner violence because there an, there's an assumption that we can't deal with race issues and deal with relationship issues. Right. It's almost kind of like we decide, well, um, we're dealing with so much racism that we have to band together. So, and um, essentially we have to put all of our energy on fighting racism. And when you do that, then that means that we leave the windows open for sexism. We leave the windows open for homophobia, homophobia and heteronormativity. Um, all of that, we, there's a whole, and, and we leave the window open also for silence around child abuse, right? Which is a part of intimate violence oftentimes. And so there's this kind of culture of silence um, and then there's our response theming where we kind of believe that there's not enough will or capacity within us to be able to deal with racism and outside and then to also do the in-house work of healing. Um, and so part of it, I think what promotes um, 
the amount of silence around intimate partner violence is for one, a fear that we can't do more than one thing at um, the same time. Um, and for two, which I think is really about scarcity. We seem to think that we don't have enough within us to be able to save ourselves together. Like it has to be one self, right? <laughs> we, have to, we have to deal with the black self or we have to promote um, the healthy family unit self so that we all, we look like we're okay. Um, and then there's also kind of within the community around, if we're talking about primarily um, violence between men and women, there's the promotion of kind of making sure that black males don't look bad. Um, and we do that at the sake of, for one, them being healthy enough to love the rest of their families, right? Um, and then there's a silence that also happens if we're talking about relationships within the LGBTQ community, they've got kind of a multidimensional, you know, there are a lot of layers around their silence because for one, they have to deal with being, dealing with the oppression of race. And then they're dealing with also the oppression of homophobia and heteronormativity. And then if you place that in a faith context, specifically with that community, there's the whole notion, well, they shouldn't be together in the first place because they're not created by God. So that's kind of what they get. So we can kind of just put these people to the side. All of that, right, is kind of like a hierarchy of oppression. And when we do that, we don't slow down to say all are important. So we have to be, we have to, and we're able, right, to care for one another in an honest, authentic, compassionate, and accountable way. Um, so I think that part of what promotes the amount of um, silence around domestic violence and domestic violence occurrences are scarcity um, and a hierarchy of being um, believing that we have to decide which one who was most important. Um, and that doesn't do anything actually, but replicate the, that, the power dynamic that is inherent in intimate violence anyway, right? There has to be, somebody has to be more important and someone has to be less important and forces the, the way, um, the method that's used to keep that in place. And that's really kind of, we do the same thing when we don't care for one another by breaking the silence and by saying that violence, period, is a problem regardless of your gender, regardless of your orientation, and regardless of your age too, right? So violence against children, there's also a significant amount of violence between, um, amongst our elder community, and there's really a lot of silence around that piece too. Um, so those are some of the factors that I would say. And so, um in this con in, 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 in some in a few of your in, of your remarks um, I heard you uh, bring in the factors uh, of um, the faith community and um, not wanting to look bad uh, um, at church or um, not wanting your family to be exposed uh, um, what now that we have uh, brought the faith community into our conversations which is extremely key um, how would you um, suggest that the church maybe um, uh, has failed to advocate uh, for um, our, our individuals, our victims um, in domestic violence? And how can we then correct that um, in moving forward um, in ensuring that, you know, we are um, just as much of a voice for domestic violence as we are for um, racism and injustice of black bodies? Sure. So right. we storm the court system and form a police station over police brutality. We'll show up for that. Um, you'll have all kinds of pastors who will be leading, um, leading I almost said riots, that's not accurate, <laughs> who will be leading rallies um, for those pieces. One of the things that I heard a judge say was that in all the years that she had been on the bench, she had never seen a pastor show up on behalf of the victim. They always showed up on behalf of the person who was committing violence, but never on behalf of the people. And so there's a way in which if the pastor is always showing up to prove that the person who's using violence is worthy of a second chance, there's a kind of an unspoken message that they are in some ways siding more so with the person who's using violence. Here comes the pastor who has the power in the church um, or the rabbi or the imam, they have the power in the faith community, and they're showing up on behalf of the person um, who is accused of using violence. And so this person of power shows up alongside of the person who's using power abusively. 
And so in the eyes of the person who's being victimized, it seems like, and I, there, there's a fair amount of truth to it, that they're primarily siding and supporting the person who's using violence, right? And so one of the ways that we can start um, kind of running um, a, a basic way is that if you have a couple um, and if you have more than one faith leader, have someone show up on the side of the person who's using violence as well as the person who is being victimized, right? So that there's an understanding that they are not siding with one another, but really siding for safety and help, right? And justice, a just kind of love. Um, so those are, that's one of the kinds of ways in which we can do it. Another part of it has to do with our theology, right? There's a way in which we, um, there's a culture around complementarity with no accountability in faith communities, right? That it's kind of like the net, the, the thing of this person comes along to complement and complete the other person. So there's a way in which they're there to serve a role and to help this other person along. Not the worst plan, but all right. What we do need to think about is a theology that says, okay, if we're gonna be helpers to one another, there needs to be some sort of a conversation around accountability, right? That love has to be accountable. And we have to define what love means. We have to take a serious look at some of the, um, the sacred texts that we're using as sources that inform how we're gonna do our relationship. Because when you, I know from a Christian tra tra um, tradition, when you start looking at the actual stories of some of these people that we hold up as models for marriage, it's a little shaky. <laughs> it ain't something I would recommend, <laughs> okay? And so are, are there ways in which we can kind of decolonize how we read these texts to see them for what they are, right? And to re really ask those questions, that happened, yes. It's in the text, yes. But is that really what God would have for me? Is that really the will of God? If you're a Christian, does that line up with the love and justice and righteousness and accountability that Christ talked about and that he lived about? I mean, and so using violence, putting your hands on someone else, um, withholding love, withholding affection, um, taking over things that don't belong to you, using threats, that none of that is Christian. None of that is Christ-like. But somehow, because we have kind of created a theology that says, if if you're supposed to be here to serve me, then all things go, there's no accountability in it, then there's a way in which our theology can really play a huge role in how we see um, relationships and then also how we view that God signs off on it, right? And so I think um, promoting um, a critical awareness, use your brain, use your mind. <laughs> Let your mind speak to you and show, you know, and believe what you see. Like, you you know, Abraham and his wife, you know, he didn't sold his, pimped his wife off, you know, so we can survive down. And <laughs> it's like, wait, hold on. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. Let's figure out another way. But um, because of our commitments and how we've been told to read, read the Bible, the Abrahamic covenant, um, because of how we've been taught to read that without questioning, we make it okay. And it's not. You know, and the same thing can be said against by, around violence against children. That whole situation where Isaac, where Abram takes his child up and is about to sacrifice the child. Now, wait a minute now. <laughs> Let's not keep sacrificing up the children. But it's in the Bible and we seem to make it okay. And it's not, right? And, um, and so being able to kind of encourage people to really think about, is this really the will of God that I bring harm to another person and allow harm to come to me? And, and Westland, um, the same question for you. Um, how would you uh, view the church as being uh, a key uh, um, part in um, advocating for uh, victims? And, and not, not only victims, but, you know, any and everyone who is um, involved in um, uh, domestic violence, uh, the domestic violence situation. Um, uh, what can the church do from your viewpoint to um, uh, play a greater role in advocating? I think the biggest thing is we have to educate our pastors about domestic violence uh, first and foremost. And also too, um, when, when a victim comes to them, they have to hear them and be able to refer them out to an advocate or an organization to help them because to go home, to tell them to just go home and pray about it is not the best situation because you can be sending this person into a very 
life or death situation. So we really have to, education is the key. I did a training at Phillips Temple um, a couple of months ago, and the pastor stood up and said, thank you, I needed this information, I did not know. And so educating our, our pastors, first of all, is first and foremost. And also too, um, the pastors, you don't hear them preach about domestic violence a lot from the pulpit too, which I think, um, and we have to be careful too, because it happens in the pulpit. So they don't want to preach on things that might be touchy to them. But we have to really pray about these things because in order, in order for us to be able to feel comfortable, because women, especially if it's a male pastor, no offense, but they're, they're not as trusting. A victim is not going to be as trusting, so they're not going to go to them. So the pastor, you know, might want to be sensitive to that and be able to, you know, refer them out. But also, too, how they can help is if the pastor, like Dr. Clinton was saying, show up when a woman has a court case, you know, be there to support her as well as you do the criminals out in the streets also. But I think another thing, too, is we really need to sit down and have big conversations about this because I think the pastor is in a great role to help us advocates and organizations to help, um, you know, change the laws, you know, get get the court system to help change the laws and make them a little tougher for these people that are going and committing um, abusive relationships to another person because God is love. And, and so if we're love, if, it, if we're loving our intimate partner the way we should, you would not want to put your hands on them because you should love them as you love yourself. So a lot of it goes back to that self-love. So we have to be careful, you know, in that too. But I think education is the biggest key and I think also, too, that if our pastors really understood it and worked with other advocate groups or organizations, I think that we can help change some of the laws and, and, and give that woman a little more power to feel that if I go to them, that I'll, feel, I'll get to a point where I can feel safe. And I think that's, that's where we have to get to is the education piece. And, and we have to be real careful about... Um, you know, I think as a community, we have to know the word for ourselves too. If you if you are a Christian and you go to church, I think we have to get the word in our heart because I truly got to a point where I believe my body is a temple of God and nobody has the right to deface my temple. And I think a lot of it is education on self-love and also um, just working with the pastors to help them go and help us change some of the laws to help protect the women and children. And even sometimes the batterer, unfortunately, but that's just where we're at. You know, our pastors have a little more power than they want to use in those areas. Yeah, Antonio, can I add to, um, to what Wesley was saying? One thing, um, and she picked up on it, that last piece around um, helping the batterer. So like that help is not just we'll pray for you, right? There are organizations like Men Stopping Violence and various different organizations across the country who come in and they run what are called batterer intervention programs that help them, first of all, see um, that their behavior is learned. It's not in yeah. here. It's not something they don't just wake, wake up and learn. How, I mean, like it's not, it's not a part of your DNA, right? Um, it, it is a learned behavior. Um, and you also um, get cues from society that say that it's okay, right? right? And so programs like Men Stopping Violence in Atlanta, they do national trainings. Um, there are several different organizations, Faith Trust Institute, they are in Minneapolis. Um, there are diff and there are also better intervention programs for women, right? Um, where they kind of help people see that part of it is their own personal choices, but we also live in a culture that supports violence and dominance, right? Mm -hmm. And so what does it look like um, if the pastor shows up to support the victim, but then they also may be running um, perhaps batterer intervention programs in another community or partnering with a batterer intervention program so that they understand, yes, we want to support you, but that support looks like accountability. Yeah. That compassion looks like justice, right? Um, and so being able to show up even-handedly um, and to support these programs, I, I, I can't say it enough, and, and Wesley mentioned it too earlier, talking about we get afraid, like if we call the police, is somebody gonna die, right? Um, and that's a real thing. Um, but everybody who calls the police doesn't die. 
right? That's true. You have to be able to support people that when they do call the police, um, first of all, just education around what happens in the court system, what's going to be their options, you know, pastors becoming educated about what happens when somebody actually has to go through a court case, um, that kind of thing. And what does it mean for the victim as well as the person who's using violence? And how can they show up even handedly with compassion and accountability for both parties? That's right. Just wanted to add that to what Russell was saying. And so, um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Crumpton, I heard um, uh, uh, in your um, conversation uh, um, speaking about, um, oh man, I lost it that fast. Wow. My question is, though, my question is, though, okay. when we hear, uh, <laughs> I know it, I know it. Um, my question, my question is, though, um, in, 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 the, in the education um, and in um, the steps that we put individuals or we, we promote for individuals to go through um, who have uh, faced these traumatic uh, events, um, <clears throat> what 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 are ways? And a lot of times, uh, I see, um, and and I'm just on the outside looking in, uh, that we do uh, we do a lot of um, uh, uh, we make a lot of attempts to uh, uh, fix or not necessarily fix, but or help individuals who have been victims um, uh, live in society after um, they have encountered domestic violence. But we do not help uh, the one who is actually the the abuser. You know, the one who is. Uh, you know, we send them to jail, and then they get out of jail, and they may uh, in, encounter a situation again and become um, an abuser again. Um, uh, what are ways can What are ways that we can uh, not necessarily advocate, but push, uh, and then maybe advocating also, but push for um, our uh, abusers uh, to enter into counseling and uh, um, therapy that helps them deal with some of these learned behaviors as you uh, spoke of in your comments? Sure, so part of it, um, it's important to recognize that a lot of, it depends on the state, but a lot, several states will have it so that if you have a um, domestic violence case, part of the condition of your release for um, probation will involve uh, attendance, mandatory attendance in a better intervention program, right? So that's first of all, um, just making people aware that that should be a, um, a step um, depending upon the state, right? Um, that can also happen even if you are not taken into custody, but, um, but if there's a, a, a protection order, part of the, oftentimes the condition of the protection order is that they participate in a better intervention program. Um, so I think it's important actually for persons of faith to know that, persons in leadership in faith to know that, because that can become a part of the conversation, right? When somebody comes to a faith leader and they've been using violence, I think it's important to say, when was the last time you, how are you, when was the last time you went? Are you staying on track with those? How is it going? When they start talking about their spirituality, are there ways in which that we can start talking about some, you know, framing some of the things that they're dealing with that those questions that are coming out of, um, let me rephrase that, the questions of faith, as faith leaders, can we start tying that into some of the things that they're being taught um, around accountability about our intervention program, which then means that our leaders need to go through training like the one that Wesley mentioned that she facilitated so that they can become um, aware of how violence works um, and become aware that we don't have to just kind of leave that to the court system, right? That exists beyond the four walls of the church. So it's okay <laughs> to bring a conversation, you know, to bring God into a conversation. As a matter of fact, that may be the only thing that saves somebody from using violence is to bring God into the conversation around if you are a child of God, which you are, why do you believe that your only option is to use this violence? Because, and, and so now we can, we can start getting into some deeper conversations around the theology of being, recovering from using violence, right? Which then also means that sometimes we got to be able to train our pastors to be able to have a conversation about God and violence right <laughs> you know we got to start talking about are we talking about the angry god who's always punishing because there's a way in which 
somebody who's using violence is it could say, I'm just doing the righteousness of God, the angry God, the punishing God, right? Um, and so part of it is that we've got to really help our um, clergy to become educated by working with people like Westland. Um, become educated by just sitting in on trainings that many of our DAs and um, assistant DAs that they, the, the district attorney's offices, they will oftentimes have training programs just so that people can become aware not only of the patterns of violence like Westland teaches about, but also about what happens in the legal system and how can we then bring God into that conversation, right, around accountability, like actual accountability. Um, so that's part of it. And also it's like the nuts and bolts. Like if there's a restraining order and you know about it, the restraining order doesn't go away in church. Okay. <laughs> it's like, I, so I understand we're, you know, in this season of really paying attention to asylum and sanctuary for refugees and persons who are immigrants and things like that. That does not hold up with a restraining order. That means that if you know you have two people in the congregation and there's violence and there's a restraining order against one, you really do have the responsibility then to let your staff know what is going, now you ain't got to tell the whole church now. Don't put it on the broadcast line on the church. <laughs> That's not everybody's business because that actually can create more violence than, than, um, than stop it. But you need to let people know if you have a security team, you need to let them know these people are not ever supposed to be in the same place ever at the same time, which means that Sometimes it, if you have one, you're lucky if you have more than one service. That means that one day, you know, on you go to eight and you go to 11 and don't even see each other in the parking lot. OK, to be able to have the commitment to love, to be able to say that right to the person. So they don't think that, OK, this is God's house. And, you know, I, I have some sort of protection that allows me not to pay attention to the protection order, right? Um, being able to just say that and also to say, if you only have one service, to be able to say, you all need to figure out, or I'm going to help you figure out which days, which Sunday, one of you can come and which Sunday, the other one can come, but you cannot, this protection order is here for a reason and you cannot violate it in this church, right? Um, so becoming educated about what the legal system requires of persons who are recovering from violence, I mean, who are recovering from the use of violence and accountability is a part of that. Um, so those are, I, I think, some of the ways in which um, faith communities can actively participate in helping persons who use violence recover from believing that violence is an active, viable, acceptable way of life. All right, as we um, can, we, we come, we are coming uh, to the end of our time. But I, I wanted to um, uh, ask you, Wesleyan, uh, uh, one more question. Um, Dr. Crumpton alluded to uh, some of the work that you are doing in your trainings, um, uh, and particularly in faith communities. Um, have you, over your time uh, in conducting these trainings, are you um, being more sought out from faith communities? Are faith communities becoming more open to wanting to understand uh, and learn more about this conversation and be educated on how um, uh, to uh, facilitate as um, uh, a key figure in the communities and in helping individuals deal with domestic violence. Are you, or is that something that you're having to do more on your end of being the voice and saying, this is what you need? I, I'm, I'm having to do it more on my end. <laughs> um, the church that sought me out, I happened to run into um, a young lady that went to that church and we, got, we, have, we had a conversation and she said, oh my God, you just have to come and do this training for all of the, it was just clergy. So all the ministers, the pastor, and, um, and she said, we'll have to have you back again. But it, it's basically more on my end. They're, they're not seeking me out yet because it's pretty fresh and it's pretty new. Nobody's really doing what I'm doing. So it really has to get out into the city. But I do, um, I, I, my prayer is that God uses me in that level to educate clergy and, and to work with clergy because it, it's very important, like Dr. Crumpton said, you know, if somebody has a, an order of protection, you have to be real careful about letting them be in the same, you know, facility and place and space at the same time. And I think that we have to, you know, our pastors do need to be accountable and to help with that, you know, that order. But I, I my prayer is that I do grow and I do, I do 
get more opportunities to train pastors on how to do it because we have to be real, real careful because you do not want to re-victimize them. And one word that you that you say to them, you think you're helping, but it's the wrong word. And then they're re-victimized all over again. And then they have to start that process all over again to get the help. So I think we need to, you know, be able to um, have more conversations about that because you really, that's a, it's a fine line. It sounds real simple and easy, but it's not a, it's not easy when you're dealing with trauma like that, you have to be real careful how you, how you speak to them and how even your body language and different things. So these are things that pastors need to learn. And my prayer is that from this conversation and conversations that I've had in a couple other churches, that it grows the way God will have it to grow to help educate the community and pastors and leaders. So, yep, I'm working there. <laughs> I'm working on that. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. And um, as we close, I want to give you all, uh, you both, um, uh, Two minutes, uh, just to uh, some closing statements on, uh, I'm, I'm not going to even preface any particular um, subject matter of dealing with domestic violence or whatever you want to say in these last two minutes. Well, I just want to thank you, first of all, for this opportunity to have these kind of discussions. I think it's very important. Secondly, um, you know, uh, with my organization, you know, I work hard with the victims, you know, to do life skills classes and teach them and help them, you know, empower them to be able to go out into the world and live a whole and healthy life. And um, my prayer is that I do get to talk to, you know, the leaders um, in the churches and stuff. But I just want to say that, you know, it, it's been it's been an opportunity to just have some of the, the clients that I do have and the women that I do talk to. And I volunteer still in shelters and, and I had a big concert um, to bring awareness to domestic violence. But um, I just want to say that, you know, refer them to me, you know, my, it's beneath God's wings in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm willing and able to have these kind of discussions and to help victims. And my number and everything, you know, they can reach you, Antonio, if they want to get in touch with me. And so it's just um, my passion and my, my ministry, my calling. So thank you. Do, you have, do you have any social media uh, tags like Facebook? I don't or have Facebook, but I do have a website that is um, beneathgodswings.webs.com. Okay. Yeah, all so right. they can go to my website and my phone number and all my contact information is out there. All right, thank you very much. And, and Dr. Crumpton? First off, again, like Westlyn, Antonio, thank you so much for the invitation to participate. Westlyn, it is an honor to be on this panel with you. I'm really glad to have been in the conversation um, with you. Um, I guess my biggest thing is right now I'm in the middle of research and work around um, activists, supporting activists in the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So that's my area of passion. What I'm aware of is that violence is happening amongst our activists. It's happening um, in our community. And so I really want us to think about how not to seem to think that we don't have enough to be able to save all of ourselves, right? We have enough time. We have enough willpower. There is enough time for us to pay attention to what's happening between partners. There is enough time to, happen, to pay attention to what's happening to our children what's happening to our older person, what's happening person, to persons who are differently abled. We don't have to choose to only fight racism. We have to fight racism first and then everything else falls behind, including people who are poor, right? Um, we have the capacity and um, we owe it to ourselves to tend to ourselves in-house, as to give as much energy attending to ourselves in-house, healing ourselves, making it so that in-house we can thrive. We have enough energy um, so that when we get done or in the moments where we retreat, we have retrieved from um, racism, that when we come home from those front lines, that our houses aren't in a shame, right? Because if we don't do that, if we win the war outside, we won't have anything left of ourselves to come back home to. Everything will still be in there. Right? And at that point, I really feel like white supremacy has really done its job. <laughs> you know, that it has distracted us enough. Mm -hmm. 
from believing mm. that we had enough to take care of ourselves. I mean, I don't want that for us. I don't want that for us. I want us to be well even as we fight, and it's possible. We don't have to prioritize um, that it has to be race first or that we have to only save the black men or we only have to save the trans people or this or that. I want all of us That's right. to be well. And I think we have, I believe we have the resources to do it. We do, however, have to have a will for it. So I'm encouraging people to make a decision to prioritize wellness and wholeness for everybody that doesn't have to uh, come at the expense of somebody. Yeah, yeah. And, and where can our, our viewers uh, find you at, Dr. Crompton? Sure, they can always email me through the seminary web website. I'm at McCormick Seminary, uh, Theological Seminary in Chicago. Um, my um on the faculty page you can look for my picture smiling happily um and my email um, address is there along with my telephone number here in the office that's the best way to reach me all right again we want to thank everyone for uh tuning in um on behalf of the young adult task force we want to thank uh, Ms. wesley waddies and dr stephanie crump for um, sharing uh, their experiences and um, all of the efforts and energy that they have put into um, this particular area concerning mental health, race, and domestic violence. Um, our Tired and Torn webinar series continues next week um, on uh, Thursday, October 19th at 7 p.m. Central Standard uh, Time. Uh, the uh, topic is substance abuse and mental health. Um, our panelists are Dr. Trina Armstrong from Garrett Evangelical Seminary and Dr. Christoph Ringer from Chicago Theological Seminary. And so we ask that you uh, um, register for our, um, all those who are viewing and will view in the future. We ask that you register um, at cuicwebinar.eventbrite.com. And uh, we have two more conversations left. And so you had the opportunity to um, register through that website. Also wanna um, thank uh, um, uh, Womack Consulting Group, Lakeisha Womack Consulting Group uh, for all of her efforts in marketing and flyers that have been created uh, and, uh, um, in, in regards to our conversation. So with that said, have a good day, everyone. Uh, Ms. Wesson Waddies, Dr. Crump, again, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.